social media <laughs> promotes toxic diet and fitness culture and there are a lot of people jumping on and saying do this don't do that food is connection and it's it's social and it's pleasure like if we're purely eating for nutrition purely eating to count macros or, or whatever it is or to achieve a physical health goal then things are getting off balance our relationship with food how does that contribute to feeling happy there are very clear links between food and mood. There's the emotional, emotional and the psychological aspect of food and the role that food plays. When you start having obsessive thoughts about anything, then it's obviously really detracting from your ability to enjoy and engage in that moment or in that occasion. A lot of people were putting their happiness on the other side of the goal. I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when. Of course, go for the goal, but there is happiness right here. How easy is it to fall into the extreme self-improvement trap? It's so interesting that something that is supposed to be good for you, like being being well and being fit and being healthy can actually lead to people being really unwell and unbalanced. Welcome back to the Chew On This podcast. We have a really great topic ahead of us, something that I personally am so passionate about, and it's everything to do with your relationship with food and just your mindset when it comes to food in general. And today I have the amazing guest, Cass Dunn here, who is a clinical and coaching psychologist. She's also the host of the Crappy to Happy podcast and the author of the Crappy to Happy books. Cass, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. You have this like happy energy. Oh, I, I get that to, a bit, actually. I don't know how to describe <laughs> it, but I feel happy being around you. So, Oh, that makes me feel good. All the tips you can give us today, <laughs> please share, because clearly your your philosophy works, you, your advice works, your theory works. So would love to learn more about just feeling happy within. Let's just start with you talking about your passion for helping people and adjusting their mindset and transitioning from a negative mindset towards food to a positive. Where did this come from? Where did it stem from? Well, I always had an interest in psychology and the, the very short story is that after I had been, I'd done my ad, undergraduate study and then I went off and did other things in work, my working life and my personal life, but I always felt called to come back to psychology just because I, psychology, just because I had an interest in it. But it had been 10 years since I did my degree. So I started working as a life coach. And life coach obviously is all about helping people to achieve their goals. And people would come to me with all sorts of goals and, you know, health and weight and fitness and finances and relationships, etc. And I loved helping people to do that. But what I noticed was that a lot of people were putting their happiness on the other side of the goal. It was I like almost like I can't wait. I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when. And it just occurred to me that this is not like, yes, of course, go for the goal, but there is happiness right here. You know, there is happiness right now and you're not allowing yourself to experience it. And so um, I guess that's kind of where it started. And I also became very interested in um, mindfulness and acceptance, that kind of Buddhist philosophy. I was doing a lot of meditation. And so I eventually went back and did my studies as a clinical psychologist um, and that's kind of underpinned everything that I do, kind of helping people use these tools and skills and strategies, which I learned, um, to find happiness right now in the moment instead of constantly postponing happiness until after they've achieved some elusive goal. Because there'll always be another thing. There'll always be another goal. Absolutely. And they say falling in love with the journey. Yes. And not the destination is absolutely. so important in all of this. Absolutely. And not tying your happiness to that end goal, but learning to find happiness in everything that you do that it comes within. I've, it, just, I've read a lot about it. <laughs> yes, it is so true. I've taken over the podcast and talking about <laughs> happiness. Let's talk about just the mindset with food specifically. Mm. How many of your, your clients um, that came to you struggled with a negative relationship with food? Was it a big chunk? Oh, look, I think it is, it's not something, I have seen a few clients who have serious issues with food. Um, but for the most part, the people who I've seen in private practice, either as a coach or as a psychologist, it's just one thing, you know, it's kind of food and it's links to health and weight and how we feel about ourselves, self-esteem, self-confidence. It's kind of just always there. So it's, I can't say that it's necessarily, you know, been the main thing that a lot of people have come to me with, but it tends to come up you know, just reasonably regularly. It's so central. Yeah, absolutely. To kind of everything 
yeah. in life and our health and our social life. So it's it's yeah. it's always there. Well, we eat six times a day. Right. So food is always around. Yes. And we it impacts the way we feel, the way we look, our emotions, our everything. energy, everything, right? And so of course it's going to have it's that piece in the puzzle, right? Mm. So today we're discussing relationship with food. Mm. How do you define a healthy relationship versus an unhealthy relationship with food? Well, I think somebody with a healthy relationship with food, I mean, it sounds like a cliche, but it's like having that balanced approach. It's not, we, we all, we use food for fuel, clearly. We all have nutritional goals and health goals. Food is obviously more than fuel. Food is connection and it's it's social and it's pleasure. Um, and so I think when we are too focused on just one, one function of food, like if we're purely eating for nutrition, f- purely eating to count macros or, or whatever it is or to achieve a physical health goal and discounting all of those other ro- – roles that food plays in our life, like the social connection and the ability to connect with people and enjoy and and purely eating for pleasure, which is fine as well, then things are getting off balance. And if we start giving that, um, you know, food kind of, if it starts becoming too central or too dominant and we start getting a little bit too rigid with how we think about food and too structured with our rules around food, then it's starting to get a little bit unhealthy. I mean, it's a very personal thing. But I guess we want to just keep that flexible approach and that, um, I know, he- healthy is the word that you use, but that, but you know, that healthy balanced approach and keep that perspective around it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when it becomes really obsessive, mm. so when food continues to be that thought, it's like, oh, like, wake up and what do I, I'm going to have this for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and I'm counting down the hours until I eat lunch, not because I'm hungry, because but because I'm thinking about my next meal or, you know, I'm only eating to look this certain way and whatever it may be, when it becomes this obsessive thought, it tends to lead to a negative relationship with food. Absolutely, absolutely. And it takes over and then it's not just the anticipating and the thinking and the planning and the rules around food and what I'll eat and when I'll eat, but then it's how do I feel after I eat. And if I eat something and then I go into whether it's, you know, guilt or self-recrimination or thinking then about I ate the wrong thing or I ate, I ate too much of that thing and so how am I going to um, counteract that, you know, that's getting unhealthy. How does it play a part in our happiness, just like food in general? And like food is one element in the way that we feel when we eat food and then also our relationship with food. How does that contribute to feeling happy? Well, that's a good question because food is, like you said, it's, the, the, I mean, food just does nutrition and it's molecular structure. Like it will have an effect on our mood. Yep. Like f- there, there is a very clear, and that's not necessarily an area that I'm an expert in, but there are very clear links between food and mood. But that's actually like the, the physical food that you're putting in your body and the way that it's impacting with your the cells in your body. But like I said, there's more to it than that. There's the emotional, emotional and the psychological aspect of food and the role that food plays. And in being able to um, go out and enjoy a meal with friends without having that occasion impacted by obsessing about what can I eat and how much will I eat. You know, anything that starts to really take over and become a central focus in your mind. When you start having obsessive thoughts about anything, um, then it's obviously really detracting from your ability to enjoy and engage in that moment or in that occasion. So, you know, food um, contributes to our happiness when we consider it in all of its aspects, like it's enjoying a meal with your family, it's taking, you know, going out for a coffee with a friend or, um, you know, just any of the things that we do in life that bring us pleasure um, that, you know, food features in. And so without having our own kind of food rules, because a lot of people with very strict food rules, um, detracting from that ability to enjoy those moments. Like happiness is there for the taking. That's the thing, right? It's like, what are we letting get in the way of that? Absolutely. So there's a lot of information online, social Mm. media (laughs) promotes, toxic diet and fitness culture and there are a lot of people jumping on and saying do this don't do that eat this don't eat that 
exercise like this, don't exercise like that. It's insane. Every time I go on Instagram, there's some there's a, a new trend that's popped up that discusses what discusses what food you should and shouldn't be eating. So, how easy is it to fall into the extreme extreme self improvement trap? Because uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are jumping online, seeing all this stuff, and then that's it. They become obsessive. How easy is it, and how do we stop ourselves? I think it's very easy, you know, and I think. Um, Unfortunately, that is one of the consequences of social media and of this kind of fitspo, like the the wellness, um, like uh, epidemic. Really, I mean, it's so interesting that something that is supposed to be good for you, like being being well and being fit and being healthy, can actually lead to people being really unwell and unbalanced yeah. and creating stress and anxiety unnecessarily. Um, I feel like it's really important to say that like that's not – I'm very big on like self-kindness and self-compassion and one of my favourite quotes is to beware of the subtle aggression of self-improvement and what I mean by that is self-improvement, like, if we want to be the best version of ourselves and fulfil our potential and, you know, have energy for life and do all the things we're capable of doing, I think that's amazing but so much of self-improvement it comes from is driven by this – core belief that there is something wrong with me that needs to be fixed and there is something um, and that I don't approve of myself. I can't accept myself until I fix some aspect of myself. And for many people that is body shape or weight or fitness or needing to look a certain way. Um, but it's not just that. It's lots of There's lots of other areas that that applies to as well. Um, and so self-compassion is key, you know, self-kindness is key. So when people fall into that trap, I think, you know, we don't want to be, um, I don't know, having people feel bad about themselves for that because like that's a that's a product of the, the society and the world that we live in that is giving us all of these messages of how we need to be different and do different and be better or you'll be happy when you do this or achieve this. And so it's very easy to get sucked into that kind of messaging and we have to start with kind of a little bit of self-kindness and a little bit of recognising when our self-improvement is actually, you know, really a whole lot of self-judgment and self-loathing for want of a better word. So how do you overcome it and how do you show self-compassion? So say, you know, I'm someone that jumps online, I am comparing myself mm. to all of these people that I'm following that are half my size and I start to really, really criticize myself. And I'm like, I should be 10 kilos lighter or I should, you know, have shorter hair or longer hair or blonde hair or whatever it may be. Or I need to be slimmer in my face. My jawline's not sharp. Whatever I'm, I'm saying about myself. How do I start to show self-compassion? Like how do I stop those thoughts? And how do I differentiate between self-improvement for me to become the best version of me versus self-improvement that's unrealistic comparing to others because like you said there's room for self-improvement we mm. can always become a better version of us but how do I know the difference between the two if that makes sense yeah it's a good question it's a good question and I think it takes a lot of um like I also teach mindfulness you know I teach mindfulness and meditation and slowing down and kind of unhooking so uh, what I try to teach people is to like it starts with awareness. It starts with being aware in the moment. Mindfulness is simply being aware in the moment without judgment of what is happening. And that is what's happening, not just out there, but what's happening within me. Like what is the story that is on repeat in my own head? And what is the f the emotional reaction that I'm having to something? And how is that impacting my, um, my urge to do something? So if I have a thought that I need to look a different way, and that creates a feeling of dissatisfaction, I don't like myself, I feel um, embarrassed or ashamed or just depressed and anxious or something. And so I make a decision that I'm going to eat in a particular way or exercise in a particular way. We can track that. You know, if you have enough self-awareness, you can kind of stop and you can see that happening as it's happening. Usually we are so unconscious to it. You know, we're just like on the treadmill, just doing the things and not actually ever stopping and pausing to pay attention. So slowing down and paying attention is the first is 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 where it starts, and then it's like checking in with yourself. Um, with I mean, self kindness is it, it takes a lot of practice. Oh yeah. 
because we're not good at it. It's the one thing that we're actually terrible at. We are our own worst critics. We're harder on ourselves than anybody else is. The expectations that we have of ourselves, are, nobody else has them typically. You know, we're not judging our best friend for being five kilos too heavy and how she looks in her jeans, but we're judging ourselves and assuming that everybody's judging us. So, you know, a little bit of that too, getting that sense of perspective about who's putting the pressure on because um, it's not usually anybody else. Um and then just in really intentionally turning that self-talk around to something that is more kind and accepting and something that acknowledges that I, you know, we're all kind of imperfect. There is no perfect person and there is no perfect um, person, that, that no person who has no flaws, you know, <laughs> like who's getting it right all the time. So tapping into that sense of kind of common humanity that we're all just doing the best that we can and even asking ourselves like would I be judging somebody else right now for the way I'm judging myself so it all just really starts with that awareness like really slowing down and actually looking at what we're thinking and feeling and what we're doing and then really making a conscious decision to kind of slow that down flip that around bring a little bit of self-kindness and the interesting thing Amal is that there's plenty of research that shows that whatever your goal is, self-criticism will will hinder your progress. Wow. Like self-criticism is the – and we all think I need to be whipping myself and berating myself and shaming myself because I did the thing that I shouldn't have done or I didn't do the thing that I was supposed to do and we're just in this like negative self-talk all of the time because we think we need to fix ourselves and that's the way to get there. Whereas if we actually – like the research is clear that that is the – opposite you will have the opposite effect not only will it contribute to stress anxiety and depression and you know low self-esteem and low self-confidence and low self-worth but you're not likely to achieve achieve the goal that you're going for anyway so no point doing that (laughs) um but you know self-kindness and actually starting with some self-awareness and being curious about what i'm doing and why i'm doing it and where what is driving that behavior that is not only going to make you feel better about yourself but you're actually much more likely to achieve any goal that you set for yourself because everything that you do, whether you're successful or not or whether you stuff something up or not or you have a setback or you eat the wrong thing or you don't, you know, whatever, you're not at risk of like this berating yourself. You take the pressure off yourself. You give yourself room to make mistakes and so therefore you're just much more likely to keep taking steps forward because I know I'm talking a lot at the moment but because the opposite is this kind of perfectionist all or nothing thinking which you know oh I've blown it now what's the point I'm the worst person I'll never achieve anything and you go into that kind of trap so you give up well yeah give up or I'll start next month or I'll start next month or I'll start next As opposed to, oh, well, I stuffed up. Oh, well, I'm human. What happened there? Where there's space to be curious about what happened then. Um, Oh, I was let myself get too stressed or I let myself, you know, I just like fell into that pattern of like emotional eating, whatever it was, what might I do differently next time? Like then there's actually space to be curious about that so that you can have the option to do something different next time. So you touch on self-awareness a lot. Yeah, I do. (laughs) And just for our our listeners – what is self-awareness and how do you actually achieve self-awareness? What are some things that you can do in order to become self-aware? That is also a very interesting question because, do you know, also, little side note, there is some research that like, like I don't know what the actual stats are, but like 90% of people say that they're self-aware, but in <laughs> only like 15% of I'm people are self-aware. <laughs> So, so let me see. I probably think I'm very (laughs) self-aware. Um, but I think that's actually in terms of like people, the awareness of like how, how you impact other people or how other people perceive you. When I'm talking about self-awareness, I'm really talking about that, like almost what I was saying before, that kind of mindfulness. So mindfulness is like, there is, there is the part of me that is like thinking the thought and doing the thing. And there is the other part of me that's able to kind of see what I'm doing as I'm doing it. It's like when you're in the middle of an argument and there's this part of you going, what are we, how did this even start? And what are we even having this argument for? You know, like that kind of, there's a part of you that's in it and there's a part of you that's kind of observing it. So it's being much more intentional about connecting with that part of you that's observing it as it's happening. And 
it takes practice. And this is why I teach people like meditation, which everybody hates. Nobody wants to do meditation because it's boring and everything and I can't do it. My mind's too busy. But it's that practicing of just kind of slowing down and dropping and, and, and kind of j just becoming aware yeah. of how what what do I regularly think? Where do, does my mind regularly go? And also it's a little bit about, oh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a skill that takes a lot of practice. But, you know, like when I get, um, if I'm upset by something that somebody does or if there's somebody online that triggers me in some way or I have a reaction, instead of just going with that, like mindfulness is also like not believing every story that you think or not always just going with your immediate urge. But going, oh, that's, again, with curiosity, like, oh, that's interesting. Like, what is it about that person that bothers me? Or what is it about that behaviour that gets to me? So it's just getting a little curious about our own responses to things and how we habitually react. And what do you do when you have an argument with somebody? Do you Are you the one who goes in for the fight? Are you the one who uh, avoids confrontation? Are you the one? You're like, so it applies to every aspect of life, but, you know, it all relates back to food. Um, but as in like how you use food for self-soothing yeah. or, you know, those kinds of things. But, um, but yeah, it's just the slowing down and being willing to be curious. And you can only do that without judgment mm -hmm. because if you're being curious about yourself, there is no, it is very difficult to be curious about yourself on your own patterns and behaviours and thoughts and feelings if you are very defensive about that. And we get defensive when we feel like shame yeah. about what we do. Um, or if we feel, um, yeah, if we, if we are critical of ourselves, so I feel like I'm being like a broken record, but you come back to that curiosity with kindness and then there is some space to actually get curious about what's going on, um, with me, to, which is all raising your awareness. Um, yeah, yeah, it's quite interesting you say that, particularly regarding like your thoughts and slowing down because I attended this workshop on meditation back like during COVID and the person that was running the workshop got a, a, a glass and it had glitter in it and she shook the glass mm. up and she was, these are our thoughts that we have, you know, every day. There's like, what is it, like 60,000 60, 60, thoughts every single day. And so she goes, so if you don't slow down, how are you able to actually think clearly when you have all these thoughts running around? Mm -hmm. And I just think what you're saying is so incredibly powerful, you know, becoming aware and slowing down and, you know, med meditating as a practice to facilitate that, to, t to essentially get you in that zone of being able to be like, okay, I'm just going to be here in this moment right now with my thoughts, with my surroundings and just slow down. And so it's actually surprising when you say that a lot of people hate meditation. It is very confronting. And it's very hard yeah. <laughs> initially. Um, or actually, no, it continues to be hard. But it is so <laughs> powerful on the mind and it allows you to make better decisions on how you yes. behave based on your emotions because you can recognise that, which I think is so powerful. 100%. So I want to talk about just mindfulness when it comes to food mm. because, you know, binge eating, for example, mm. or emotional eating comes from not being aware of what you're actually doing as well. So it is, you know, self-soothing. You're feeling a certain way, whether you're, you're stressed or you're down or whatever it may be, and you resort to food. Mm. In that moment, most people are not aware of what they're actually doing. So they go and grab the ice cream, they eat that, then they go get a chocolate block, they eat that, a packet of chips, whatever. How do you actually create that mindfulness during that time that a binge is about to happen? So like mm. how do you become mindful or self-aware in that moment, what are some tips you can provide our listeners? Yeah, well, so obviously, I mean, just hopefully somebody having listened to this conversation or just having that spark of awareness, like, oh, yeah, I should, like, if I slow down. But obviously, oftentimes in that moment, our reaction, our emotional reaction is so automatic that it happens before you know it. And that's that's the time when you kind of, after the event, bring some curiosity and some compassion, like what led to that? Like what was the lead up to that? What was I thinking? What was I feeling? What was going on? How might I prevent that? Or what might I be doing differently next time? The research says that, um, and I bang on about this a bit, that you can't hope to be more mindful in particular situations, like in that situation where I'm about to have a binge or in the situation where I'm dealing with my a family member that triggers me every time and, or, or, you know, that 
meeting with my boss where I get really anxious. Like you can't hope to be more mindful in those situations just by thinking I'm going to be more mindful. Like <laughs> I'm definitely just going to be more mindful in future. Like you, you learn to be more mindful by practicing meditation and I know everybody hates to hear it, but you got to practice med- Like It is like going to the gym to build the muscle yeah. so that in the moment when you need to draw on that strength, it's there, you've cultivated it, you've learned it, and it becomes it becomes a skill. It is, a tr- it is a, an attention training yeah. skill, a mental skill that you practice through meditation. Um, so ideally, and if you're not one to sit for 15 minutes and just focus on your breathing because you tell yourself that your mind's too busy, again, which is just a story that you're believing, like mindfulness is being aware of that story and not believing it, um, then you can take little opportunities. So, you know, maybe next time when you're driving to work, you just turn off the radio and you just feel your hands on the steering wheel and focus on the sound of the traffic and focus on the colours of the buildings. Like that's mindfulness. It's just being fully present in the moment. And you might also notice oh yeah, I'm thinking about that meeting that I've got this afternoon. But you don't get hooked into the story of the meeting. You just observe that that's something that's on your mind. And you might also notice that when I think about that meeting, oh yeah, I feel kind of a little bit anxious in my tummy. Like I think I'm a bit worried about that meeting maybe. And so you just start using these little opportunities through the day to become more present, fully present and aware. And I recommend to people like tune into your five senses because usually we are just in our head. We're so completely disconnected from our body, which is why we don't feel, no, when we're hungry and we're not hungry. We can get to that. Um, but, you know, we're so up in our head with the thinking, 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 thinking. We drive to work and we, before we know it, we've just parked in the car park and we forget the whole journey. You're like, how did I even get here? How did here? I even get here? Yeah. Oh, my God. How did I not cause an accident? Because yeah. I wasn't even where I was driving. But shower is another one. Like, you know, instead of just thinking about all the things I've got to do during the day, smell the shampoo, feel the pressure of the water on your skin. Shower is such a good time to Sense. be like, my to do nothing. I know, everybody, the shower's the best. <laughs> the best thing the can happen the in, the thing, in the shower. But, but it's like fight, bring your awareness to your senses because you're, we are so out of our bodies usually. We're so in our heads. Being present to our f- senses, what can I hear? What can I see? What can I taste? What can I touch? What can I feel? What's the pressure on my body? And then even bre- then moving that to within your body and to within your mind, but from that observer stance, like little opportunities during the day. If you're not one to meditate, just go for a walk when you're driving the car, when you're in the shower, find those little opportunities um, to just practice that being fully present and aware in the moment. And over time, you'll start to build that skill and that ability to kind of catch yourself in the moment Yeah. before you're about to do something that you might regret. It's incredible what you notice when you're actually present when you're driving and when you're walking because Mm -hmm. particularly when you take the same route every day same walk same drive but I you know made this effort to become more mindful during my walks no music no podcast no nothing just really observe 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 look around what's happening like what's the weather like what is the scenery like what can I smell and I would notice these artworks and these quotes and you know these plants and I I was like, wow, I walk past this every single day and I've never yeah. noticed this before. And it's just incredible what you actually start to notice when you're more mindful and present when you're doing these things that you do daily anyways. So true. So let's talk about hunger signaling because you did mention that. <laughs> yes. And you said there's a disconnect between, you know, our mind and our body and how we feel because we're always in here and we aren't feeling what's happening. Anything here. below the neck. Yes. <laughs> so talk to me about that. So are you saying that a lot of people um, are not able to actually identify when they're feeling hungry because it's all in their head and they're just like? Oh, I don't know if it's a lot of people, but I I think that when we are so we are so in our head all of the time, we're very cerebral creatures. We th- we even think about our feelings, you know, like we're so afraid to even feel what we feel that we go into justifying and analyzing and rationalizing our feelings. Like we are so like unwilling to go and be with our feelings, but also we are out of our bodies. Um, so, and that just doesn't apply to things like food and am I eating because I'm hungry or am I eating because I'm stressed? You know, am I eating because it's just a habit because I just walked past that thing or I walked past my favourite donut place and that's just what I do, which is that just kind of some other trigger or association that's causing me to eat or have I got through the whole day and not eaten, I forgot to eat, 
because I was so busy in my head and going from one thing to another. And then suddenly I realized I'm famished at the end of the day, which can also lead to potentially binge eating. But we also were just like, um, I had one client once. It was when I very first started practicing therapy and I was first using mindfulness and meditation with clients. And this client used to walk into the session and from the beginning of the session to the end of the session, all she did was talk, 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 tell me everything that was going on in her life and all of the problems she was having. I literally couldn't get a word in and I was not a very experienced therapist. So I really had trouble interrupting her. And so I decided, okay, next time she comes in, the first minute she walks in, I'm just going to say, okay, let's do some meditation. So she walked in and before she had a chance to speak, I got her to do this like mindfulness practice and do this meditation and what could she hear? And I got her to tune into the sensations in her body. And at the end of that meditation practice, I said, so what did you notice? And she described like this heaviness in her chest and this like kind of constriction in her throat and this like churning in her stomach, all of these physical sensations in her body. And I was gobsmacked. And I was like, were you like, did you know that that's how you felt before? And she said, no, like not until I stopped and paid attention. And so for me, that was just like profound. And I realized just how powerful it is and how often people were so busy in our heads that we're disconnected from our bodies. And so tightness in our shoulders, you know, or people suddenly have a panic attack and they don't realize that they've been like in their fight or flight response for however long. And again, like though, when we're not in our body and connected to it, we're not, um, we're just not aware of a lot of these signals that our body is naturally sending us. Like our body will tell us when it's hungry. It will tell us when we're full. Um, it will, and it will, it will tell us what we're feeling emotionally, like not just physically, but emotionally, it's all stored in our body. Um, so that slowing down and bringing that presence means that we can be more discerning in the decisions that we make because we're more present and conscious and intentional instead of just like going with um, those emotional, you know, triggers or, um, you know, all of the things that we do on autopilot that are not necessarily like responding to our physical needs. Yeah. So what is an exercise someone can do to practice meditation, like a very – someone that's never done it before, they're a beginner, what's a good way to get into it? And is there something that you would recommend they they can do for five minutes a day that you can share with our audience? So mindfulness at its core is um, slowing down, you know, you can sit down, feet on the floor, like you said, turn off distractions, try to be uh, undisturbed and just focus your awareness on breathing. And so as you breathe in, you're not thinking about breathing. You're not slowing your breathing. You're just taking a breath in and noticing the sensation of the breath. Again, it's all connected to your body. Just noticing how the breath feels as it goes through into your nostrils, down the back of your throat, into your chest and into your belly. You'll feel a rise and fall, it's like an expansion and contraction, and then the breath will go back out of your body. And if you can just do that and just follow the movement of the breath, this is the thing that gets people. Like They think that they're thinking about breathing or they're manipulating their breathing. It's like, no, just be with the physical sensation of breath moving in and out of your body. And then the thing is, when your mind wanders away from the breath, which it will, because it's very used to having a distraction, a phone, a ping, a somebody, you know, like that. your mind is just like going all of the time. It's not going to like this breath business. It's quite boring, not interesting enough. (laughs) Um, It will go somewhere else, guaranteed, Well, then you just notice when that happens and you bring your awareness back to the breath with no judgment. No, I'm hopeless at this. See, there is no point to this. I'm the worst meditator. My mind's just too busy. Like every other human being on the planet says the same story. You know, it's just like, oh, there goes my mind. That's what minds do. That's okay. And I just come back. Now, if you can do that for 10 breaths, that's a great start. And the other thing that I do, like if you can build that out to three minutes or five minutes, amazing. If you can add in, what can I hear? Like, you know, once you kind of with the breath and you've got the breath thing going and that's okay, then start, oh, like, what can I hear? And just turn your attention fully to, are there sounds in this room? Are there sounds outside this room? You know, just focus fully on that one thing. It's essentially having an object that you have, you intend to focus on. And then you just notice whenever you move away from what you're focused on. And that trains your mind 
to be become aware of what's going on. But the other one that's really good, just as a second one, is what we call the three-minute breathing space. I call it like an emotional or a mindful kind of check-in, which is just like really useful like during a busy work day or if you're feeling a bit stressed and uptight about something, which is just stop for a minute, take a breath, kind of center yourself and then just ask yourself, how do I feel in my body right now? Oh, like am I a little bit like are my shoulders kind of up around my ears and is there tightness in my forehead? Like just, okay, soften that. What is going through my head right now? Like, what am I thinking? How do I feel right now? Like, is there a little bit of like a bubbling kind of anxiety or worry about something? Am I feeling relaxed? Am I feeling a little bit like annoyed about that person in that meeting that said that thing? Like, am I still carrying a bit of that with me? Um, Breathe into all that, like make space. We're not trying to fix anything or change anything. We're just becoming aware and we just make the space for that. Um, And then kind of have the intention of just softening noticing like okay this is good and then just moving on with your day doesn't mean you automatically fix that and you're suddenly like zen master not stressed anymore like it just means okay now I'm aware because five minutes ago I wasn't five minutes ago I was just in my head and my feelings were going and my you know my shoulders were tight and I was just carrying on with it at least now three minutes I've taken a breath I've stopped I've become aware I've chosen to kind of soften things down and hmm now I can just move on with a little bit more spaciousness. And I can actually take control over my behaviour. Yeah, now I can choose how I go into the next thing that I'm about to go Which and is do. so important, regardless of what it is, whether it's going in for an interview exactly. or an important meeting or, you know, if you're about to have a binge, whatever it may be, right? Mm-hmm. But it just gives you a little bit more control, which mm-hmm. I find is what meditation or being mindful really helps with. So to wrap this up, I could ask a million more questions, but to just – finish this episode what are three tips that you can give our audience for (laughs) maintaining a healthy food mindset that they can apply from tomorrow oh three tips amal okay well um number one i think is um if you are a person who tends to be a little if you know that you're a person who tends to be a little obsessive and a little got a lot of rules around food, um, then try just bring a little flexibility to that. Like remember that well-being is not just physical. Yeah. Well-being is also social. Like it's also like allowing yourself to enjoy the pleasures in life. And so if you are focusing purely on physical nutrition and health and weight at the expense of all of the other aspects of well-being, then that's a little bit unbalanced. So it's like broadening your – maybe just broaden your definition of health and well-being – to include all of the other aspects. Um, obviously, I'm going to say start like just being practicing meditation or at least taking those little moments of opportunity to be more mindful and more present and self-compassion. Like it has to be – I know these are things I've already said in the in the show, but to wrap up, like the self-compassion is key. Yeah. Self-kindness is key. It is – the self-awareness and the self-kindness as the foundation for everything. You don't have a hope of changing anything for the better in your life and in your behavior without those two things underpinning it. Like you will continue to go around in circles if you are in this cycle of self-judgment and self, you know, constantly needing to fix yourself or think that you need to be something different. So self-kindness is key. Oh, absolutely. Even just saying to yourself, I don't need to lose five kilos. No. I love my body as is. Do you know what? If I, if I, if I knew right now, if a, a um, fortune teller told me right now that you were going to keep this for extra five kilos or 10 or 15 kilos, like for the rest of your life, that nothing you do is going to change that, like what would you do differently? How would you just take the pressure off? Like would it really matter to you? And in the meantime, in your refusal to accept that and your resistance to that, like what are you depriving yourself of in terms of not just food, life, pleasure, enjoyment, social opportunities? Like it's like if you had to – if this was the way you were going to be for the rest of your life, would that be okay and what would you do differently? I think that can be really insightful. I'm going to end it on that because that was so powerful and I just want that to sit with our audience. (laughs) Cass, thank you so much. That was great. And 
I'm going to go back to meditating after this conversation. (laughs) So really glad we had this chat. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I loved being a part of it. Thank you for tuning in and I'll see you at the next one.